Hello, my name is Lama Chuyat. In this presentation, I want to talk to you about the concepts of reliability or generalizability. The reason why is because I see that in many examination or testing or assessment organizations, reliability is often reduced to only one type of measurement or one type of quality indicator, typically Cronbach's Alpha or Kudo Richardson's. And I want to argue that there are many more ways of looking at reliability or generalizability, especially in the context of programmatic assessment. But before I can show you a couple of other approaches, uh, I want to go down to what the central problem of generalizability is. Like in scientific research, we co collect samples and we make want to draw conclusions about a whole population. The sampling problem exists in assessment as well. We can only test so many items per test or have so many observations in workplace-based assessment, um, but we want to infer something which is almost infinite, something like competence. We are not only interested in how students perform on these particular cases or these particular items, we actually are interested how a student or a candidate would perform on any other given situation. The, the problem with reliability is that we have small samples and big domains. Typically, people think that standardization or trying to make the assessment objective is the best approach to reliability. Uh, what I've shown you here in this table are the reliability or generalizability coefficients of several types of tests. And what you will see in this table is that on the left-hand side, you have the more structured tests like the MCQ, and on the right-hand side, you have the most or the least structured tests like uh, continuous visual consultations. What you will see is that the difference in reliabilities aren't that big. Uh, but what you will also see is that the reliability increases dramatically if the sample size or the time of observation increases dramatically. So the concept of repeatability, would the students get the same score on a repeated test or another test, um, is not always the best approach to reliability because it depends on what you think that the universe or the whole population of possible items would look like. Let me give you an example from the clinical domain. If I have a homogenized blood sample and I take the hemoglobin level three times, I expect three times the same value. If I find different values, I conclude that my measurement is not reliable. And it's not reliable. On the other hand, if I take the glucose level of a patient and I determine it an hour apart three times and I find the same value, I've also got reason to believe that my uh, measurement is not reliable because I ex expect glucose to vary. So what does that mean for, um, what does that mean for reliability or generalizability? In the slide here, you see a, a little sample, and the sample is internally consistent. All the pixels are equally blue, are actually the same color blue. Um, if I were to translate each pixel to a, a one zero score of an item, you would find a perfect Cronbach alpha. Yet the question is, do we, are we seeing the whole picture? The picture may vary, and there may be much more in the picture that we haven't sampled simply because we concluded that internal consistency that inter-item correlations were good enough. So going back to the sampling, because the simple message would be that you always have to collect more information, but that's not always doable. Not more, but more efficient is probably more helpful. Let me give you an example. The, um, in programmatic assessment, we combine qualitative and quantitative information. Uh, so that's what we do in clinical work as well. If I have a 65-year-old patient with pallor and fatigue, etc., I uh, may order a hemoglobin level and I may order do colonoscopy with biopsies and or a pathology report. 
if I order a hemoglobin level, I want the, uh, I don't, I'm not interested in the lab analyst opinion, I'm only interested in the number. And the number, the reliability comes from repeatability, from 95% confidence intervals, etc., etc. But for the pathology report, I don't want a number. I actually want the pathologist's opinion, their expert's opinion. And the, the credibility, the reliability of their report comes from the way they address my question, the plausibility of their argumentations, and their expertise, their, their education. If the pathologist were to give me a number with 95% confidence intervals and the lab analyst would have given me a story, it wouldn't be informative. So the reliability in both measures comes from different sources. The one is statistical, the other one is staff development. The second thing is that uh, in efficiency we should try not to overdiagnose. Once we know something about a student uh, and we've got clear information, we should actually stop sampling. We don't need the same sample for all students. Here's a, a, a bit of a complex organogram, but uh, it shows a couple of things to in, improve reliability. It's about judging portfolios. What you see is there are elements of assessor training. The mentors are trained and the mentors produce benchmarking exercise. So we increase the expertise. It is a whole year, so the mentors have a sort of prolonged engagement with their students. They get to know their students very well. There is a member checking. Mentors and the student, they uh, give the, 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 both their opinion, and as long as there is agreement, there is only a marginal check by an external mentor. If there is no agreement, we add more mentors up until the moment where we can safely say that we've got a good judgment. The reliability can therefore be built into the organization. And the organization should be such that it actually produces, that it keeps everybody on track, and that it makes all the parts of the information uh, credible, like the example with the pathologist and the, uh, the hemoglobin level. So it's about clear and inescapable rules in programmatic assessment. It's supervisors who inform their students frequently so everybody is on the same page. Uh, there is a self-responsibility and a self-involvement of the students. There is a possibility for a second, uh, second opinion or an external view. There is peer evaluation between mentors. So we build, you build expertise in the process uh, to increase the, the credibility, the reliability uh, of your decisions. There are training programs, conditional rights to switch mentor. S if things actually don't work, you would have a safety net procedure. Uh, and there is transparency in the whole process by careful documentation and note taking. So those are all measures that increase the reliability of the judgment. What I've tried to present to you is to demonstrate that there are different ways of establishing reliability of parts of assessment in a program of assessment. There are the standard ways I discussed with structured standardized testing, the standard psychometric ways, they still can still be upheld, but there are also ways of dealing with the credibility, the reliability of judgment of more qualitative parts and there are ways of dealing with combining qualitative and quantitative parts. So the, the stories, the judgments, and the, the numbers parts of an assessment program. And they can be dealt with at the organizational level. Uh, I really hope I was able to make clear that there is so much more than the standard approaches. Thank you very much.